It's time for another Dice Tower Review with Z Garcia. Hey, hey, everybody. Today I'm taking a look at a board game called Scylla here. In this one, the players represent Roman senators trying to garner the most prestige by doing things like feeding the people, constructing great works, uh, dealing with crises before they, uh, before they happen, things like that. And so the game has quite a bit going on. There's a bunch of small moving parts in it, but you are ultimately attempting to do that. Control what's happening, use your influence in a very cunning way in order to come out on top. So let me give you a look at how this works. We'll come on back and I'll tell you what I think of it. All right, so here's the game mostly set up, ready to begin. I'm going to show you only the setup for one player here. I have my starting token, and I have some characters that I uh, drafted at the beginning of the game. The game's going to be played over five rounds, and we are going to be attempting to garner the most prestige, which is tracked on this track right here. Each round is going to go over several stages, uh, using this marker to keep track of where we are, then it resets the beginning, second round. Do that five times, game's over, most prestige wins. Uh, here is what you are attempting to do, how you get those prestige tokens coming from a few different places, but mainly, you are trying to gather these tokens here, uh, which the, val uh, the value of which is going to be determined at the end of the game, depending on where these markers are on the board, and these are going to move up and down, depending on some crises that are going to take place throughout the game. So, uh, I'm going to take you through an entire round here, and that should give you an idea of how the game plays out. Uh, the beginning of each round, the very first stage, is deciding who is the star player for the round, and that is going to happen with each player. There's a random player at the beginning of the game who is the first one, uh, tr uh, putting an influence towards gather garnering that, uh, that title. Each of my senators here is going to give me one, and it tells me right here on the card in which phases their powers are active and important, in this case, phase one and phase six. I gather uh, a vote from this card. It also tells me this is a Christian character right here, and it tells me up here the, uh, the ability it has to construct buildings a little later in the game, and all the characters work the same way. So, for example, this one here, uh, is uh, only has the yellow at the top, but it's going to give me a different power in phase five. So there you go. So at the beginning of the round, I am going to try to control this. Starting from me, I already have one built-in vote, and I can spend some money to kick that up. So let's say I, I say I have one, and I'm willing to put in two more deniers. My power is three. We go once around the table. With anyone who wants to pay, uh, you know, to gather more than that, controlling it ultimately. Let's say I say three. No one else goes above three. Everybody else simply passes the other three players. So I win. I pay the money. And I'm going to get that power. The first thing is I'm the star player, obviously. And then I get any one of these tokens I want. So I'll take, uh, let's say, this one. Put it behind my screen. Each player also has a screen which I'm obviously not setting up for the sake of the example here, but everybody's going to have a screen to hide their money, hide their tokens. And then lastly, we kick up the famine track here, equal to how many times it showed up in the crises cards. In this case, there are two of these symbols in the corner, so this goes up to two. We'll contend with that a little later. That's it for step one. Step two, we are going to draft some new characters starting from whoever is the star player that was just determined, which in this case I kept it, I am going to grab one of these characters and take it for myself. I am going to take this uh, merchant right here. And so I'll take the merchant, I'll add it to my face-up display of characters, and each other player is going to take one. So let's say someone takes that one, someone takes this one, last player takes this one. All right. So those have been given around the table, and we move on to the next stage in which we build buildings. Starting from the star player again, I'm going to put one of these up for auction, and these do different things. Uh, for example, this one lets you in phase uh, four there, you can pay two deniers to get any one of the tokens, any one of these tokens. This is going to feed uh, the people, uh, two points worth of food there. Same thing, uh, this one uh, gets you more income every round. This one is a crane. As soon as you win these, 
you are going to take the matching crane card and this simply lets you build buildings more efficiently later on in the game. So that's how those work. So let's say I, I want to, I'm looking at my cards here, I want to put this crane up for auction. Depending on where it landed, this was randomly thrown out here, it tells you what you must spend in order to acquire it. And so in this case, the characters I can use, these are all my characters, towards uh, gaining that crane, all of these have that color except for this one only has yellow, so I'll put that back down. So all of these I could uh, utilize in order to gain that building. But since I'm the star player, I go last. And again, once around the table. So let's say this player says, okay, I'll pay two. Next player says, I will pay not more than that. So they'll, they'll pass. Next player says, I'll pay three. And then it comes back to me. I could, if I wanted to, exhaust four of these characters. Um, because the last person said three, and I could get that crane. So I could do this, one, two, three, f uh, three, like so, and I will gain the crane. However, the characters that I have now uh, exhausted no longer work the rest of this round. They, I won't get their benefits for the rest of the round. So it's that's the give and take, the characters, you're going to be use, able to use them for several things, but you have to decide which ones to use them for. So let's say I don't do that, I'll let the player who wanted it for two take it for two and, um, or three rather, and then this goes to them and whoever won it puts another one up. And this continues until five of these buildings have been given out. And then the, uh, that phase of the round it's over. Let's say I ended up with one of these and it cost me, uh, oh, I don't know. Let's say I spent this person and I spent this person. All right. So those two helped me out in gathering that tile, the famine tile, which is going to help me, as I said, feed my people. We go to the next stage, which is income. You are going to get a, a base of three coins, which is right on the tile you start with here. And then one more for every merchant that has not been exhausted up to this point. I have one more, which means I get four deniers. I get those, I add them to my pool, and we go on to the next phase. Very simple. Again, checking always the powers on the cards, and the powers on the buildings you've built based on the phase. And they're all very clearly labeled. We go to the next one here. And in this phase, we are going to be dealing with some crises that are rising up around Rome. And uh, the way this works is every player that has a um, the Vestral Virgin or the, uh, oh, what's his name? This character here is going to get a cube of their color. Let's say I'm playing red. I only have one of them. So I'll put a cube right on him. Everyone will do that around the table. And then starting from the star player, you'll put a cube on a card you are hoping to control and prevent from happening. Two of these events are going to happen. And so we'll go around the table, players doing this, placing out tokens and so on. Uh, so I go here, this player goes there. Uh, we are going to, there's probably not this many cubes, but just for the sake of our example here, Let's say it looks like that, all right? Once that's done, then we are going to check which ones happens, happen, which ones do not. The ones that have the most tokens on there are not going to happen. So we are definitely preventing this one at the bottom, Decadence, which is always in play, actually. And then of these two, they're tied so that the starting player will pick which one does not happen. So this one won't happen, and let's say I'm the start player and I don't want uh, this one to happen. Sure, so we'll go with that. Um, whoever added the most influence to stopping something from happening is also going to get a bonus. And so the persons uh, or person or persons that added the most here are going to get one prestige. So I'll give it to them now. And then uh, this one also was prevented. And so the player playing the black uh, color and the white color are going to get one of those tokens each. The tokens are right here at the top. So we'll divvy these out to those players. And then this one goes away. Normally the one with the most cubes goes away, but Decadence can never go away, so it'll be the other one. That one is simply discarded out of the game. And the other two do happen. And they do whatever they say they do. So in this case, there's a volcanic eruption, so this token is going to drop one. And in this case, this one uh, gets rid of our stalls. And so if anybody had a stall, which is a type of building, that would go away as well. And uh, the people that gave the most to these are going to get the tokens. So I would get one of these. I said I was red. And then the white player is going to get one of these. And we move on to the next stage. This is going to get replenished by a new one. 
like so, and these can now be removed. So that's a little influence style game. And then in the next one, we are constructing the Great Works buildings around uh, Rome. Uh, the one right here is the Senate. For this, you are going to be using your influence, again, from your senators, assuming they are still standing and not exhausted, and your money. This is simultaneous. Everyone's going to put as much money as they want to in their hand. They're going to hold their hand out with their thumb sideways. And then you vote up, which means you are contributing to helping build the building, or down, which means you are giving the money to the plebeians. You are helping the people of Rome. If you help the people of Rome for every two votes, down, that is, right, with your thumb down, you get one prestige. And so if I did that, I have one from this character and three more, that is four in total, I get two. Boom, boom. If you build up, then whoever did the most gets five, whoever did the second most gets three, and for every five votes up, we advance this token one space forward. So that's how that works. And again, depends on the players, kind of how they want to manipulate what's going on in the Senate. Once this is done, the Senate card moves up here. We reveal the next one, and there's a few different ones of these. And this goes to the next stage in which we have to feed the people. And we take a look at this track here. Everyone's going to lose as many prestige points as uh, the famine level. Except if you have, of course, the, uh, the building here that allows you to not have to deal with that. In that case, you don't lose the victory points. Uh, and that's it for one round. This is going to reset here. We'll again figure out a new starting player. We are going to readjust Famine based on the track here. And uh, these are going to continue being manipulated. One more thing I want to mention right here. If any of these tokens falls all the way down into Crisis, then we are also going to be dealing with that. And the way that works is everyone at that point, the people of Rome are quite upset, of course. Everyone's going to reveal the tokens that they are holding of the relevant kind. They're behind their screen. So they show how many. Whoever gave the most, whoever has the most, has actually been working towards that problem, which means the people understand that and that you get three prestige points. Whoever has the fewest uh, is blamed for the crisis and they are going to lose three prestige points. And then everyone returns their tokens back to the, you know, back to behind their screen. You don't lose them. You just have to show how much work you've been doing towards, uh, you know, the betterment of the... Um, the, uh, the, the people, you know, the plebeians. And so that's it. And then you come back to the first part of the round again. We go to the second round. You can keep track of where you are because the, uh, the great works you've built would have moved up here face down with a piece of gorgeous artwork showing there like so. And we do it again. So there you have it. That should give you an idea of sort of how the game works. A lot of manipulation, a lot of sort of deciding whether you want to use your characters for something now or for something later building buildings, creating combinations that work for you. You have the uh, A buildings, which are right here, and then the B buildings will show up, and then the C buildings will show up. You'll go through all those things. At the very end of the game, after the five rounds, then we are dealing with this as well. For every Christian character you have that is still face up, some, some cards will turn a character face down. But um, if you have a, every Christian character that's face up, you get two prestige points, and then also you may free your slaves at the end by paying two deniers, for each one, and if you do so, for each slave you free, you get three prestige points, and that's the game. So, that should give you an idea of sort of what's going on in the game. Definitely not a comprehensive overview, but a pretty good idea of what's happening. Let's go back up top. Let me tell you what I think of this game. All right, so there you have it. That is Scylla. So let's go over some talking points here. First of all, thematic ties for the game, I think, are really strong, surprisingly strong. It's not a game that I figured would captivate me with its theme, but it does. I really enjoy all the machinations going on in the game. And it feels like you are being manipulative. Not necessarily in a nefarious way, but you are manipulating things to have the outcome you want. And I enjoy uh, the way everything sort of works together in that way, from a thematic point of view. The aesthetics here and the quality of the components is very high. I like the look of the game. I think the design, the graphic design is on point. Everything is clear. And the quality of the components is very, very high. So good, good job on the aesthetics. The replayability and the scalability. The game is only for three or four players. And I'm fine with that. It works well with three and with four. I would have much rather they do that than say, you know, two to six or something. And then it doesn't really work that well. So that I'm, I'm happy with. And the replayability is pretty high. I enjoy 
uh, how much could be different from game to game. You'll end up with different characters, different buildings, different crises will come up. So that, that all works together to tell you a different story each time. Though, yes, you are going through the same phases in the same order every round, but I find the replayability to be high. I've, I play this game a lot. I've owned this game for a long time, and I I've always find myself enjoying it when I play it. The replayability certainly is there. The game length is uh, pretty good. Five rounds, I think, works well. Five rounds gives you enough time that you've gathered quite a few characters, that you have been able to manipulate the things you want to manipulate, that you've gathered the right tokens for yourself, and now you're trying to push that track up to score a bunch of points for those tokens. And so it, it seems on point for me. The ease of play, which includes fiddliness and things like that, I find the game to be pretty clean. It's a, it's a clean design. That means that even though there are quite a few vase phases, even though there is a lot going on in it, they are each clear, they are each distinct, and what you are doing, what's good when, the money, the influence, the symbols on the characters towards building, is all well laid out, it's all, uh, you know, designed to help you play the game, and that I think is apparent, so I enjoy that as well. And then lastly, the tactic, tactics and strategy, and of course luck, uh, the game is very interesting, very tactical. Uh, there is also quite a bit of strategy here where you can decide the things that you want to throw your weight behind, if you would, and then try to make a concerted push towards that. If you really want to be able to control the crises that happen, get tokens that way, then make sure you are drafting the Vistral Virgins or uh, that other character. I forget what his name is. The, uh, the soldier. And so, you know, those are going to give you the cubes that go on those cards. If you want to manipulate having a lot of money, then, you know, get the merchants. It's, it's interesting. There's a lot here that has repercussions throughout the game, even from round one, even from having drafted the cards at the beginning. And if I was going to say a small negative, that would be it, is that, yes, the game is going to be rewarding to someone that has already played because it expects quite a bit of you at the very beginning. Not a big, big deal. But be aware, your first play of this might be a little, eh, I guess I picked the wrong characters at the beginning. You know, you might have a little bit of that. Uh, there's no wrong choice, but you'll, if you were hoping to go for a strategy that you realized you took the wrong characters for, well, just you're going to have to go for a different strategy. You know, if you ended up with a bunch of the characters that have a lot of the symbols, like the slaves, then buildings is sort of what you want to go with. Just build a lot of buildings because you can pay for them. Um, so that's it. I really enjoy this game. I think it's a fantastic Euro game. It's criminally under uh, underrepresented out there, it seems to me. It's not a game that a lot of folks have played even, uh, never mind talk about. But it's one that I think is very, very strong. It's. I have to say, I think my favorite thing about it is the fact that it is very much a Euro game. You are manipulating bits. You are moving cubes and gathering prestige points and things like that. But it is richly thematic, if, especially if you read the rule book. They've found a way to imbue every moving part in the game with something that feels like you are in the Roman Council uh, doing your Roman Council thing, you know, and I like that very much. So this is a very good game for me. I very much would recommend it. Fantastic design, interesting, engaging the whole time through. So this one is going to get from me a seal of excellence. Very good stuff. If you can find a copy, if it catches your eye, certainly check it out. That is Scylla. Thanks so much for watching the Dice Tower videos. Find more great videos and reviews as well as our top rated audio podcast at Dicetower.com. You can also find other great shows at Dicetowernetwork.com. I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching the Dice Tower. The Dice Tower is sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., where you can find great games for great prices. Cool stuff in stock. Check them out at CoolStuffInc.com.